Pop-Up Theatre presents Sherlock in Holmes, hosted by Alexandria Tan. Welcome, listeners, to another Holmesian podcast episode. Today in the hot seat, I have none other than Pop-Up Theatre's very own Mr. Scott McQuaid. It's been a challenge, to say the least, to get him on the show as he doesn't really like doing interviews. But after lots of persuasion, a bribe of an endless supply of caramel macchiatos, and my total allegiance to pop-up theatre, he has finally agreed to come on the show. It's great to have you here, finally. Yeah, well, thanks. It's uh, utterly horrible to be here. Um, So for those who are new to our channel or a first-time listener, Scott is the founder of Pop-Up Theatre and the resident writer and director of all the shows that you either watch or listen to on our platforms. He also works as the resident director at Champaka Performing Arts Company and is the founder of the indie movie company Plastic Monkey Films. He is an avid Sherlockian, having written three stage plays and five audio plays of The Famous Detective. So let's get straight into it. What was your first introduction to Sherlock Holmes? So when I was a kid, I remember seeing the famous silhouette outline of Sherlock Holmes, you know, with his hat and his pipe, and it was on the Baker Street Underground station. It was his image, like, and it was printed on all these tiles there. And I remember sort of like asking my mum, you know, who was that? But I think the actual first time I watched any Sherlock Holmes was Basil Rathbone. To be honest, it didn't really hold me. I mean, I was an 80s kid, so, you know, we had a lot of great movies coming out around about that time. Uh, So the first Sherlock Holmes film I actually watched was The Young Sherlock Holmes in 1985 with Nicholas Rowe. And I thought it was great. Uh, That's what got me into the Sherlock Holmes universe. From there, I watched, like, Jeremy Brett in the Granada TV's um, Adventures of Sherlock Holmes and... uh, of course, you go backwards then, don't you? You rediscover the interpretations of Holmes in the generations before you. So I watched Peter Cushion, Christopher Plummer, Basil Rathbone, Christopher Lee. Yeah, you know, them guys, Roger Moore, yeah. And do you have a favourite Sherlock story by Arthur Conan Doyle? Oh, it's got to be the final problem. I mean, it's so epic. You've got Moriarty and the drama of the Reichenbach Falls. I mean, right from the story opening, you've got, like, vulnerable Sherlock it's a really different side we've never seen so yeah it's got to be that one yeah um okay so last year you released your first audio production which was Sherlock Holmes in Ripper Street which to date is the most successful episode in the series since you've always directed for stage and screen what brought you into audio theater the pandemic yeah I mean I'd actually always been interested in producing a piece of audio theatre it was like a medium I'd never touched and um, I remember I used to listen to these storybook tapes like cassettes in the 80s and it had all these sound effects and music and it made you use your imagination and paint a picture of the characters and the location in a more specific way to how books are read so when Covid struck the world I was thinking you know you've got all these actors sitting about in lockdown doing nothing and You know, I I need to tell stories, so how can we do this? I saw a lot of people doing the Zoom-type theatre, which doesn't really work for me, personally. I mean, it's great to forge on and produce live theatre, so I applaud that. But for me, personally, all those boxes on the screen are just kind of a constant reminder that the actors are detached from one another. So I turned to audio theatre, where the possibilities are kind of endless. You know, you can go anywhere, write any elaborate scene and not have to worry about budget. Don't even have to worry about getting the actors, you know, to share the same physical space. Yeah. And why did you start with the Jack the Ripper story? Well, it's the story Doyle never wrote. I mean, the time zone is exactly the same as Victoria, London. I actually think the first Sherlock Holmes story, Study in Scarlet, come out a year before the murders started. I often wondered, you know, why, why didn't Doyle sort of never tackle this story you know but then once I started writing it I realized why there's no ending to the story because the murders suddenly stop and Jack disappears I mean we don't know what happened to the killer so I realized early on that the ending is going to have to be completely fiction but I still wanted it to be authentic in the suspects and the evidence so I have a fictional ending to conclude the Sherlock story but I have the real factual story and events play alongside that And that kind of blueprint, that theme, just carried over to the other Sherlock episodes. Mm. I think I satisfy the historians while entertaining the conspiracy theorists and hopefully pleasing the Sherlock fan base all at the same time. Right. So you touched briefly on the real factual elements of these stories. Can you tell us what the preparation and research was like for the Sherlock Holmes podcast plays? I know that you went 
to lengths to preserve and present the historical accuracy of the true crimes. Yeah, I'm very particular about authenticity uh, in this work. Um, well, in all my work, really, but especially with a home series because you're playing with real-life crimes, real places, real people. So I try to get as much honesty in the story as I can. I always go down like a rabbit hole with each episode and I talk to authors and criminologists, scientists, mathematicians sometimes to get the math right when Sherlock's sounding out a deduction or something. Right. Yeah, I consult various people, really, to um, to each subject, you know. So when you have this evidence and material that's accumulated, like, over, what, 30 years or more, you know, you have that hindsight of the crimes which makes Sherlock appear that more brilliant in the writing because he's working out all of this in real time. So, yeah, I work with Ripperologist uh, John Malcolm on the Ripper Street episode for, like, almost a year on that one. Uh, I talked to Steve O'Dell quite a bit about his father as the prime suspect in the Black Dahlia killing. Uh, I had back and forth messages with um, journalist Gerard Williams. Most people would know him for um, the History Channel's uh, Hunting Hitler show. Yeah, he was on that. And um, he wrote lots of books, which I read, um, Hitler's Escape Going to Argentina. So for the Walls in Exile the episode, you know, I really worked with him on that. And, I mean, he had so much... Um, evidence to support this theory it was really well let's just say it gets you thinking Mm, because you're a little bit of a conspiracy theories buff yourself am i right well yeah i am as in as much as i am to the coin of the phrase meaning i have alternative theories which are not proven they're theories ideas about the subject but you know most conspiracy theorists are sadly not that right yeah they kind of believe in their theory as fact where for me that's not the case. I don't fully accept the rhetoric given by the government or the mass of society, but I'm still open to it. Yeah. So um, let's say, uh, like, ah, the Warren Commission, um, their version of what happened on the JFK assassination. I don't fully accept that as fact, but that doesn't mean I believe that Malcolm Wallace was the gunman in the school book depository and E. Howard Hunt was on the grassy knoll. It, you know, it, it means I don't know but I'm open to ideas. You see, an idea can change, but a belief can't. An idea or a theory can change according to the information that may strengthen the notion, or it could be detrimental to your theory. Either way, your idea will change, you see? Right. I mean, I'm a storyteller, and conspiracy theories make for great narrative. Yeah, for sure. So, I'm a little bit, okay, maybe a lot biased, towards the Black Dahlia episode myself, but I have to know, Do you have a personal favourite episode? Yeah, that's kind of difficult, really, to pick just one. I mean, in terms of producing, like, audio sounds, I really enjoyed doing um, Wolves in Exile and Lincoln's Gun, you know, because you're playing with, like, World War II planes, or if you're in the Wild West and you've got, like, horses and the saloon bar and guns. So that's a lot of fun to create that image for the audience. But in terms of narrative, I suppose Ripper Street, um, Black Dahlia... They're kind of more appealing because of the unknown factor, the conspiracy theory behind who the killer could be. But, yeah, I can't really choose. I mean, I do like the adventure element to Wolves in Exile, you know, because that's the only one where they go off to foreign places, they get on boats and planes and and, um, motorcycles, where the rest are very much detective cases. Yeah, uh, Yeah, I can't really pick... Fair enough. Um, So one thing I noticed is that you're a little bit Holmes yourself. I think your deduction and observation skills would make Sherlock proud. And I guess you wouldn't look too bad in a deerstalker hat and a calabash pipe. Uh, Did writing all these Sherlock Holmes plays heighten your powers of deduction or was it the other way around? Your own mind palace lending itself to the story and Sherlock's perspective of it? I think a bit of both really. I mean, Doyle done such a great job at writing Holmes, the character, so it's, like, really easy for me to pick up and just write how he sees things, you know. I can't take any credit for that. Um, In my opinion, I think he's the greatest fictional character ever written. But I've always been observant. I think it's a key trait of a director, you know, to see things from a different point of view and to see things before they happen to kind of combat what could go wrong on stage or look through the film lens and sort of, like, see what aesthetically looks right. You know, um, I do notice that when I write Holmes, I immediately think from a perspective and particularly um, if there's holes in the crime story and I have to connect the dots to get Sherlock to that evidence, then I do tend to look at things in a really precise way. 
What about when it came to the casting of these plays? How did you come to cast Paul Zaraga as Sherlock and Tom Godfrey as Watson? For Paul, the moment I heard his voice, I knew I'd found my Sherlock. I mean, that's actually how I was introduced to him. It was like a voice recording monologue. So I never saw him. And that's kind of how you want to be introduced to like audio actors. You want their voice to be able to paint a picture of who they're going to be. So when I heard his voice, just he had this natural eloquence and all-knowing authority to his tone, you know. And that's what the voice has to be. That's what the Deson Retcher of Holmes is, the all-knowing sort of... Um, appeal to his brilliance um and we're only going to get it through voice so it was really important to get that right and we just you know discovered the sherlock that we wanted to portray between the two of us and um he continued to you know develop home's speaking voice with each episode mm. now for tom i had actually seen him in a play with my sister so um, I asked my sister to get his contact details because i could see he would make a really good watson and yeah, I mean, he's great, especially doing the storytelling element, uh, the narration. He really brings a drama to it. So yeah, I got lucky with my actors. Yeah, they're great. I mean, they really did a good job in that. So who is your favorite Sherlock Holmes? Well, I have to say Paul Zaragar, right? Uh, no, I mean, on screen, I think Jeremy Brett is the most authentic version to Doyle's writing. But personally, I really like Benedict Cumberbatch's portrayal. I mean, of course, with the writers from uh, the BBC show that helped develop that version. So, last question. Go on in. I know what it's going to be. I'm not answering it. Um, I think you have to. Are we out of time? Are we out of time? Yeah. No, we still got oh. time. <laughs> Damn your efficiency. So? Here we go. Will there be a second season of Sherlock Holmes podcast plays? Okay, there will be a second season of Sherlock Holmes podcast plays, but not until next year. There you have it, listeners. Sherlock Holmes will return in 2022. And this brings us to the close of our entire Sherlock Holmes factual fiction series. It's a little bittersweet. Um, but do stay tuned for Pop-Up Theatre's Dinner Theatre series, where you will be able to listen to new original plays and interviews with actors, directors, and authors from both stage and screen. I would just like to say thank you to my guest, Scott McQuaid. No, oh, thank you, Alex. You made the entire experience very unpleasant. <laughs> okay, Scott. <laughs> All right, so remember you can listen to our original Sherlock Holmes podcast series on all major streaming platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Also, remember to check out our YouTube channel where you can watch our past live shows and virtual theater events for free. From all of us here at Pop-Up Theatre, we'd just like to say a very big thank you to everyone who has supported and listened to our Sherlock Holmes podcast episodes. It's been a very fun journey, and we hope you've enjoyed it thus far. We can't wait to show you more of our work. To stay updated, you can follow us on Instagram at popup underscore theatre. And for more original theatre works, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Well, I'm your host, Alexandra Tan. Until next time.